This is Kublin. And Oates. This is part four. We are going to cave oh. the properties of quadrilaterals. So, the first thing you're going to have at the top of your quadrilateral family, of course, is the quadrilateral itself. Now, we're going to change the view here so you can get a better view of it here on the desktop. So, as you can see here with the quadrilateral, there's nothing special about it, so we have no markings at all on this side. However, there are some properties that go with the quadrilateral. And I have those on the other side here. The definition of a quadrilateral is it's a closed polygon with four sides. The properties are that all interior angles add up to 360 and all exterior angles add up to 360. Due to technical difficulties, Mr. Coogler will be representing the kite rather than Miss Oates for this particular set of videos. Uh, we are looking at the kite, which is probably one of the most versatile uh, quadrilaterals you could possibly run into. It's got all kinds of crazy congruencies, but it's pretty much broken down into the fact that you're looking at four right triangles. And these four right triangles happen to have a pair of each, so you've got two sets of congruent right triangles. And the way we're going to get that is by knowing that the consecutive sides, or that there's two sets of consecutive sides on a kite that are congruent. So these two sides here are congruent, and these two sides here are congruent. This is what makes this a kite rather than just a regular quadrilateral. As soon as you have that situation pop up, you have some really interesting things happening. Uh, you've got your diagonals at that point become perpendicular to each other, which of course, once you utilize the perpendicular diagonals, you've got four right triangles. And once you have the four right triangles, it's pretty easy to identify that you're going to be looking at hypotenuse leg relationships to prove that two triangle sets are congruent. So using the hypotenuse leg triangle congruency, you can see that this leg here is going to be congruent to this leg here based on the reflexive property of congruence. And then you've got this side and this side congruent based on the property of a kite, or actually the definition of a kite. And so with a hypotenuse leg, I can prove that this triangle here is congruent to this triangle here because I've got right angles going on here from the perpendicular intersection of the diagonals. Once that happens, all the other parts of this triangle set become correspondingly congruent, utilizing CPCTC corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So that means that this angle here is congruent to this angle here, this angle here is congruent to this angle over here, even though I don't have it properly marked for that particular piece of information. Um, and of course, the set of sides is going to be congruent as well, proving that this shorter diagonal has been bisected by this longer diagonal. And going through all that, you can replicate the same information here for this set, because once again, you've got these two legs congruent, here's your reflexive property, Here's your 90 hypotenuse leg HL triangle congruency proving these two triangles congruent. So once again, all these angles are congruent. So you got all the CPCTC happening inside of this setup of four right triangles. Now let's go ahead and break it down to the official statements that you're probably going to want to utilize. Um, however, showing you the four right triangles is probably the easiest way to remember all the parts of the kite that are congruent and the parts that are not because this one really, it's just kind of out there. It's not as, uh, in my opinion, as uh, nice and formulated as a par parallelogram would be because there's so much repetitiveness in a parallelogram. This one's got it all over the place. Um, so just to go over the list real quick. you got two pairs of consecutive sides that are congruent. Once again, that's just talking about these two sides and these two sides here that are consecutive. Adjacent is another good word here you could utilize because they share a vertex. Um, so you're looking at those two sides being congruent. Um, you're also going to see here where it says the two angles between the non-congruent sides are congruent. These are the angles here between the non-congruent sides because this side and this side are not congruent, this side and this side are not congruent, so that's non-congruent sides. Uh, these angles themselves are going to be congruent, as you can see in the marking I have on this side of the kite as well. So that full angle there is congruent on both sides. Uh, the um, other angles at the other vertices have been bisected by the diagonal, which of course we just saw when we looked at the CPCTC, where these corresponding angles are congruent based on the fact these are uh, congruent triangles here. Uh, but that also shows that these diagonals are bisecting these vertices here. Um, we've already talked about the, um, the diagonals are being um, perpendicular. Uh, we are we've already talked about the four right triangles. But one thing I do want to point out is when it comes to testing, probably the most common problem I see presented with the kite is going to be something involving the Pythagorean theorem. Because you do have the 90 degree angle going on in there, it's very, very easy for them to put some measurements on the other side or, you know, over here. 
uh, throw some measurements here like a 3, 4, and then what's this measurement here? Well, if you know your Pythagorean triplets, this measurement over here is going to be a 5. However, they might put x over here, and then you have to use the corresponding parts of congruent triangles or congruence, therefore x would be 5. So expect things of that nature specifically when you're looking at a kite problem, um, especially if you're looking at proofs as well. Um, expect to be utilizing triangle congruencies with the CPCTC following up with that. Um, the area formula for the kite is uh, the area equals one half the two diameters, uh, diagonals, sorry, the two diagonals multiplied by each other. You see this anytime you have perpendicular diagonals. However, this is the only formula for a kite. Uh, when you see it in the rhombus and the square later on, the other option for a parallelogram is also available there. But this is the only option available for a kite, so you have to multiply the two diameters and take half of that. And now we're going to take a look at the trapezoid. As you can see here, the trapezoid itself doesn't have a lot of markings. However, there are some new terminologies we should be familiar with. The two parallel sides, we call them bases. We call them base one and base two. It really doesn't matter which one is one and which one is two. Once you've got it labeled, just be consistent and you'll be fine. The other two sides are called the legs. Now, this just refers to the two that are not parallel. There are some properties here that you do want to know. Base one and base two are parallel. Also, there's something called the median, where it goes from the midpoint of one leg to the midpoint of the other leg. This median is also parallel to the bases. The consecutive leg angles are supplementary because it's the same side interior angle set. Now, this has two possible area formulas. The first formula is area is one half of base one plus base two times the height, or the median times the height. All right, the next one we have is the isosceles trapezoid, isosceles trapezoid. So the properties of the isosceles trapezoid, the bases, top and bottom, are parallel. Angles on the same base are congruent. So the two at the top, two at the bottom. Consecutive leg, opposite angles are supplementary. Consecutive leg angles are supplementary. Diagonals are congruent. Diagonals intersect each other proportionally which creates two sets of congruent line segments. The area of an isosceles trapezoid is one half the base one plus base two multiplied by the height. Next up comes probably the most important quadrilateral in my personal opinion, that is the parallelogram. This guy is the base of so many properties and fun proofs we're gonna do. As you can see, I've got it fully marked up with all kinds of congruencies because this man is loaded full of them. Let's take a look at some of these. First off, the opposite sides of all parallelograms are always going to be parallel. It's where it gets the name. But that also means that the opposite sides are also congruent, a major property that we use quite frequently. The opposite angles are congruent as well. So this guy and this guy are the same. This guy and this guy are the same. Now, really cool is going back to the same side interior angle sets where the consecutive angles are supplementary because these are parallel lines. So it's working the same way. That's going back from unit two. Diagonals bisect each other, which means it cuts it exactly in half. Diagonals also create two congruent triangles. So whenever you cut one of these up, you've already got SSS going on for the congruency theorem, proving that we've got two triangles by one diagonal. The area of a uh, parallelogram can be identified by taking the base and multiplying it by the height. Now remember, height is not this measurement here. It is an altitude from one base to the other base that is your height measurement, not this. So be very careful when looking at those numbers. They will try to trick you. All right, next we have the knotty rectangle. Get it? Not in the wood. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Rectangle is awesome because it's not a square. Anyways, another corny joke. Um, rectangle's properties. The opposite sides are parallel to each other. So these two and these two. Um, opposite sides are also congruent to each other. All of the angles on a rectangle are congruent to 90 degrees. 90 degrees. Okay, the diagonals are congruent to each other, and the diagonals also bisect each other. The area for a rectangle is your base times your height. Next up in the parallelogram family is the rhombus. This rhombus has been perfectly marked, as you can see, with the congruency marks for the angles and for the line segments. Also notice there's a little right angle marking there because those are perpendicular diagonals. Let's take a look at all the fancy properties of this guy. 
Because it is a part of the parallelogram family, you do see that the opposite sides are still parallel. Now, the thing that makes this different from being just a parallelogram is the fact that all four sides are congruent, not just the opposite sides. After that, the opposite angles are still congruent. That's still uh, left over from the parallelogram by itself. Now, in this case, consecutive angles are going to be supplementary, but it doesn't matter which set because we're talking two sets of parallel lines. The diagonals bisect each other again. Diagonals are perpendicular. And di diagonals bisect the vertex angles. What that means is these angles here, the bi diagonal comes through here. I've now got two congruent angles up in this one spot here. That happens in all four of these vertices. Now, you've also got two formulas again. Because it does have the perpendicular uh, bisecting diagonals, you can utilize this one, which came from the kite where area is one half diagonal one times diagonal two, or you can go with the basic quadrilateral or the, the basic parallelogram one, which is area times base times or area is base times height. The final shape is the square. I like to refer to a square as the perfect shape. If we flip it over and look at the properties, we can see that all of the sides are congruent. All of the angles are also congruent. They equal 90 degrees. The diagonals of a square are congruent. The diagonals bisect the opposite angles, creating 45 degree angles. The diagonals bisect each other. Diagonals are perpendicular. And the opposite sides of a square are parallel. To calculate the area of a square, you multiply the base times the height. Or you can multiply 1 half the first diagonal times the second diagonal. As you can see here, you've got the entire quadrilateral family flow chart. This is taken from the textbook, uh, page 393. You can see that the relationship starts with the quadrilaterals at the head. And if you go with no parallel sides, the only special property there, or special shape, is going to be the kite. Uh, when you have one pair of parallel sides, that creates a trapezoid. If the legs happen to be congruent, then you're looking at an isosceles trapezoid. Uh, when you go in with two sets of parallel sides, it does lead to the parallelogram, and then the parallelogram can either go with congruent angles, uh, specialized past that point, and that creates, the, of course, the rectangle, or congruent sides, which creates the rhombus. And then finally, if it has both congruent angles and congruent sides, that creates the square. Now, this diagram is not nearly as detailed as what I made with my Christmas tree. I would uh, like to see the extra details that I have on the Christmas tree talking about uh, the additional congruent legs or congruent angles and things of that nature because basically those connection pieces should allow you to create the definition simply by following the line from the head quadrilateral and then whatever's written on the line would create the definition for the shape you end up on. So for instance, if I started the quadrilateral, I would say a four-sided shape with one pair of parallel sides and the legs congruent would be an isosceles trapezoid. So I would simply uh, follow what I had written on those lines for the definition of the shape.